Uh, welcome to Taking the Stress Out of Injection Molded Parts with SOLIDWORKS Plastics and Simulation. I'm Damon Tordini. I'm the Product Manager for Plastics and Flow Simulation at Hawkridge Systems. So let's think about a, put ourselves in an engineering situation. What's causing the stress in the situation that we're looking at on the screen? screen? You may have seen the model on the right-hand side of your screen before. This is a product called a 4240 spreader, uh, manufactured by a company named Palmatro. This was done in SolidWorks uh, several years back. And it's a piece of rescue equipment, similar to the Jaws of Life, that, of course, is used to save people's lives every day and get them out of uh, damaged buildings or cars. And uh, in this case, uh, of course, if you take a look at the sort of the operation diagram of the device, the way it works is you've got a really powerful actuator in that piece of equipment that's going to essentially push on a yoke uh, on the inside and uh, which is mounted to the sort of orange cover piece you see there and it's going to open up the arms uh, of course that's going to spread some metal apart and as you can imagine when you operate this piece of equipment that's going to put some loads on the hinge components that you see uh, sort of between the arms and that orange cover piece so of course we would uh, we know well in advance that there's going to have to be some strength requirements that we meet for this product. And of course, uh, many of you are probably familiar with the fact that SolidWorks has stress analysis tools built into it, which could help you predict what those stresses are from those load loads. But if this is going to be an injection molded plastic part, maybe to save manufacturing costs you know, instead of uh, machining it out of steel or aluminum. When we load that part, what's really causing the stresses and maybe potentially causing the part to fail or break uh, when we use it? Is it the loading that we apply to it itself or were there already stresses in the part from when it was manufactured or how it was manufactured? Well, we can get a better answer to that question by using SolidWorks and the associated tools to simulate both the loading and the manufacturing process and combine them together to get a much more realistic prediction of what's going to happen. If you're familiar with Hawkridge Systems, you probably know that we have a, a wide variety of uh, tools and solutions and services that we offer, um, mostly stemming from a SolidWorks design environment. And so we're talking about the simulation uh, realm of, of solutions right now, which would include SolidWorks simulation, SolidWorks flow simulation, Simulia Abacus and some of the other tools that we offer. So if you are a SolidWorks designer and you're looking to use simulation in the SolidWorks environment, you may be aware that we have something called SolidWorks Simulation, which is an FEA, uh, finite element analysis tool to provide uh, stresses and strains and displacements on your model due to some sort of load. And, uh, but you might may not be aware of is that we also have something called SOLIDWORKS Plastics, which is uh, also embedded in the SOLIDWORKS environment. And that is intended specifically for simulating the injection molding process and figuring out what your part is actually going to look like when it comes out of the mold and, uh, and other aspects of how easy that is to do. So what we're going to do in this situation first is run a stress analysis on that part based on the loading situation uh, of using the spreading equipment. And we're gonna look at some of the stresses in there, but then we're also going to use SolidWorks Plastics. And we're gonna use that first just to do a simple fill analysis to try to figure out if there were any defects in the part from when it comes out of the mold that would somehow combine or worsen the stresses and, and give, a, give us an issue. So as far as SOLIDWORKS simulation goes, the FBA tools, you may be aware there are some different packages of SOLIDWORKS simulation. And if we just wanted to start with a basic stress analysis on that part where we put the loads and fixtures in, we could accomplish that with what we call a static study. And that is available in uh, all of the SOLIDWORKS simulation packages that you see, whether it's simulation standard, simulation professional, or simulation premium. In fact, if you already have a SOLIDWORKS Premium license, you have access to that type of study as well. This is the stress analysis on parts or assemblies 
for uh, static loading conditions. So let's take a quick look at how we would do this static stress analysis first, just to estimate if we're anywhere close to a stress issue when we are going to use this machinery. I'm going to open up SOLIDWORKS here. I'm in SOLIDWORKS 2018 Zerfact 2, which is the current release of SOLIDWORKS. And I'm going to open up that 4240 spreader assembly. So here's the assembly in SOLIDWORKS. It's a couple dozen parts, and it's got a little section view on it right now so that you can see that actuator sort of in the middle there. And I know because the, that uh, orange cover piece is sort of bolted at the back, but also connected to the uh, spreader arms, that it's going to have sort of a tensile stress on it. It's going to try to stretch it and, and potentially break the material. So I can analyze the stresses in that part either by simulating the full assembly or if I just wanted to, let's say, speed up or simplify the analysis, I can open that part by itself and, uh, and just sort of estimate what the forces are going to be from those spreader arms. So let's go ahead and look at it that way. I'm just going to click on my orange cover part there and open it. And I'm going to go to the SOLIDWORKS add-ins tab and first just turn on SOLIDWORKS simulation. So some of you may have done this before. If I want to just check what the stress in this part is due to some static loads, I can go to my simulation tab. I have a button over here on the left called New Study, which I can click to make a new study based on whatever license of simulation that I have. You can see I've got a simple static study there. I could also do things like frequency, thermal fatigue, or other more uh, advanced things. But we'll just do a static study for right now because all I really need to do is put a force on the holes where those spreader arms connect, the larger hinge holes, and I'm going to mount it at the back where those bolts would be and see what the stresses are. So let's just call this you know, baseline design static. So when I create my new study, you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, the feature tree gets split in half. And the bottom half of that menu is now my study setup tree, where I can go down the list and put in the conditions that I need for my stress analysis. You can see already at the top of there, I've got the name of my part. And the material's already been applied. When I modeled this part in SOLIDWORKS, I put a nylon, a PA type 6 material on there from the default SOLIDWORKS library. You can see, if you take a look at this library, it's already got the elastic modulus and the yield strength and the other mechanical properties that I need for the simulation. So I don't need to change anything about the material there. And uh, since this is just a single part, I can skip right to putting on the fixtures and loads for the simulation. So I'll go ahead and right click on my fixtures. And of course, there are different types of fixtures you can apply in simulation to represent a real world condition of how something is held in place. You could do something simple like a fixed geometry or maybe a fixed hinge, which would allow rotation. I could even get a little more advanced here and go down to on cylindrical faces, which would allow me to sort of individually select which directions I want to allow these holes to move in. And I'm just going to click both the hole and sort of the counter bore as well. And I'm just going to say that I don't want these uh, holes here to move axially because I'm going to assume that they are bolted down. And I also don't want them to rotate because I'm going to assume they're threaded and, of course, aren't, you know, aren't free to spin. But they will be allowed to sort of stretch radially just in case the load is really high. So I can put those loads on there. And then, of course, I need to put uh, my external loads such as a force or a torque or pressure, gravity, any a number of other loads. In this case, uh, of course, I'm, I'm going to have that actuator pushing on the spreader arms, which are connected to those larger holes at the other end of the part. And that's, of course, going to translate into a force. So I can just put a simple force on the inside of those holes uh, to mimic the load. Of course, there are other more accurate ways I could do that. It could actually include the spreader arms and put some sort of connector or even a contact between the components there. Or I could even try to use something like a bearing load, which would concentrate the force on only one side of the hole with sort of the right distribution. But for right now, I'm going to keep it simple and just try to put 
a regular force on those holes, which is going to be a uniform uh, load. So I'll just click the inside face of the two holes there. And of course, I don't want a normal force. I want it to point in the direction that the motor is pushing on the assembly. So I'll go to the selected direction option. And I can pick either a plane or a face of the model as my reference here. And then just say that I want a normal force in that direction. So I've got the normal to plane box selected. And I'll just switch my units to English units here and put in a value of 2,500 pounds. So there are two covers on this assembly, which means the bottom one is also going to have 2,500 pounds of force. So we're talking about a total of 5,000 pounds right now. So now I've got my part uh, fixed and I've got loads applied and the materials on as well. And so the last step is to just create the mesh and run this. So we'll go to the mesh folder, I'll right click on it and say create mesh. And I'm going to use the new blended curvature based mesh, which will do a nice job of automatically refining the elements for me in areas like small fillets or holes or other areas. And I could also turn on the draft quality mesh checkbox. If you've never seen that checkbox before or never used it, what it does is it switches your mesh to a lower quality version for testing purposes only. So if you want to speed up your simulation as you're trying to figure out the right way to set it up, or for example, you're trying to make sure that contact sets or materials are applied correctly, you can turn on the draft mode and uh, run your simulations faster for testing purposes until you're ready to do your actual simulation to get the final results. So we'll use the blended curvature based mesh here, which is gonna refine the elements for us where we need them to be. And once the mesh is done, we can go ahead and run the simulation. You can see in this case, I get a message about high aspect ratio in my mesh, which is just warning me that I might want to go back and refine the mesh better in certain areas where I've got larger, more skewed elements. But for right now, this is good for a first pass. And so I'll go ahead and hit run this study. And of course, just like always, I'm presented with, in this case, a stress plot, but I have other types of results too, like uh, normal stress, displacement, strain, or anything else that I want to look at. So I can see right away that the highest stresses are sort of in the corner here of these sort of thicker grid regions, which are trying to bear most of the load. And it doesn't look like we're really anywhere close to failure. In fact, if I wouldn't create a factor of safety plot, I could see exactly how close I am to the yield stress of the material. I've done that over here in a previous study. We would go through the procedure here and uh, type in, of course, what the failure stress is that I want to check for or use the one from the library. Uh, but in this case, it shows me that my minimum factor of safety is about 2.6. So that's, you know, I've got a pretty good amount of margin there. It's decent enough for a first pass design. I know that I'll really be able to handle more than 2,500 pounds uh, before the part yields, at least according to this simulation. But are there other defects or issues from the manufacturing of this part that could cause problems, even though I don't think I'm going to have any yielding from the stress? Well, that's where SolidWorks plastics can come in. So SolidWorks plastics is the tool that's built into SOLIDWORKS to simulate the injection molding process. And it's got a large database of plastic materials in it, which you can select from, and apply to the part to simulate how the mold cavity would be filled based on its material, its geometry, its gate location, and other factors like that. And of course, most of the time what you will use SOLIDWORKS plastics for is to just check basic questions about the part, such as, if the mold could actually be filled uh, with a reasonable amount of pressure or what the clamping force would be or uh, other basic parameters like that, how long would it take? But you can also use SOLIDWORKS plastics to predict certain kinds of defects in the part. And so one example of that would be here in the plastic standard package where I could take a single part and simulate the fill of that one mold cavity and then predict things like air traps or weld lines. So if we go back to SOLIDWORKS, I'm still in this same part file. And 
I can actually turn off the simulation add-in. Let's say if I want a network license and I want to free that up for somebody else, I can simply save the simulation data and then turn on the plastics add-in instead. And I would check that license out. And so SolidWorks Plastics, when I enable that, will let me use a wizard interface to really quickly set up a fill simulation of this part to predict what those defects might be and if there were anything that would impact the stress analysis that I just did. And so if you use the uh, getting started wizard on the right hand side of your screen here, that could walk you through the steps. Otherwise, you could also do it manually if you choose to just by going to the plastics manager on the uh, left hand side of your screen. And we could make a new simulation uh, by creating a new configuration in this model. Say new fill analysis. And the first step when you're using SolidWorks Plastics is to create a mesh. So we'll go to the Plastics Manager. We can do both solid and shell mesh in SolidWorks Plastics, which is similar to the options you have in SolidWorks Simulation. And of course, those are just appropriate for different types of parts, different geometry. This particular part is relatively thick in several areas. So a shell mesh, which assumes sort of a uniform wall thickness, is probably not a great option. So we can use the solid mesh instead for better accuracy. And that solid mesh is available in all versions or licenses of SOLIDWORKS Plastics. So I can simply right click on the solid mesh and go to manual. And I can go through the solid mesh procedure here and again, sort of a wizard uh, format where I confirm that the part is representing my mold cavity. I choose a triangle size that I want to mesh the part with, such as let's say eight millimeters in this case. And also this is where I would have the chance to manually or automatically refine the mesh if I wanted. And then I could fill in the volume of this part by generating the solid mesh from these surface triangles that you see on the screen here. So the meshing process looks pretty similar as far as the results of the mesh, uh, although the actual options you have are a little bit different in each tool. I can use a tetrahedral mesh here to fill in the solid with tetrahedral elements, which is the same as what we did in SOLIDWORKS simulation, although it doesn't have to be. We could use other types of mesh uh, for each simulation, such as, in this case, hybrid mesh or even hexahedral elements, which are more like cubes. And they'll still work together fine. So I can hit Create Mesh. And this will show me a representation of the mesh on the inside of the part like that see that the volume has now been meshed in addition to the surface. This is a relatively coarse mesh, but we're just going to stick with that as a first pass just for demonstration purposes. And of course, I can finish the meshing wizard here. And once that is done, I'll have access to the rest of the plastic setup tree to define the other conditions that I want. And you have a lot of options, of course, as far as how you define the molding process such as how quickly you want to fill the part or what temperature you're planning on injecting the plastic at. But if you want to just keep all of those settings at their defaults, which would be the manufacturer recommended values for the material, all you have to do is pick what that material is from the library by right clicking here and going to open database. And this is where you see that large library of about 4,500 materials. And these are all real world plastics from real world suppliers. For example, if I go down to PA6 nylon, I can see uh, manufacturers like BASF and the brand names like Ultra Mid, or I've got manufacturers such as Bayer, uh, EMS, and others. So I can pick whatever material I want here. And of course, this is going to have the associated material properties such as the viscosity or PVT curves that the software needs to simulate how easy it is to actually fill the mold and when the material will begin to cool into a solid part. The only other thing I would need to define is what we call the injection location, which in this case would be where the gate is, although I would also be able to model the full runner or screw system in a multi-cavity mold with higher versions of SOLIDWORKS plastics. So I can double click injection location and I can choose where I want to gate the part. For example, I might choose this spot here on the front. And I can click Add Location. And I can also manually select the exact elements 
that I want to be included in my gate. So for example, I could uh, use a rectangular gate like in this example, or I could create a split line feature and refine the mesh if I wanted, let's say, a circular gate or sub gate or fan gate or something else. So at this point, we would simulate the fill and pack analysis of the part. And I'll just show you briefly here what that would look like if we start up the solver. You can see it's calculating how the cavity will begin to fill over time. And it's beginning to show me some partial results as the fill pattern develops. And it shows me what the temperature ranges are and what pressure I'm at and also what flow rate I'm at. So I can get an idea of how long it's actually gonna take for me to fill this part, which is another thing that I could override, although right now I'm using sort of the manufacturer defaults. So let me just cancel the solver here, because I don't wanna wait any longer. And I can switch to the finished one that I ran earlier. You can see that uh, you know, it runs pretty quickly, although I should have used a slightly more refined mesh in this case if I wanted the more detailed results. But I can switch back over to the one that I ran before. And we're going to call this one gate A because we're going to test out sort of this first gate idea to see what happens here. So I'll switch back to that configuration. And if I go look at my results, I can look at the fill results here. And of course, I can animate the fill process. In this case, because it's such a large part, it looks like it takes uh, almost 10 seconds to fill that cavity at sort of the manufacturer recommended properties. But it does fill, and in fact, if I look at what we call the results advisor here, it'll pop up and tell me if the part does fill, which in this case it does at very low pressure. Such a large cavity and the nylon is a fairly easy to fill material that it's not gonna have any issues. So I know that I'm not worried about whether or not the part will fill. I'm not worried about short shots or clamping issues, but I might be worried about other types of defects. And one potential defect that can have structural implications is called the weld lines plot. If I check this box to turn on the weld lines plot, what you're seeing on the screen is where the plastic melt front will recombine as it goes around a hole or around a, some sort of cutout or other area of the model. And so in this case, for example, you can see that there were going to be weld lines on the sort of outside faces there of the hinge, as well as kind of in between these mounting holes up at the top. And what this weld lines plot also shows you is the angle between the melt fronts as they come together. If the melt fronts are more or less parallel, that would be an angle of either zero or 180 degrees. But if they come in at around a 90 degree angle, that tends to be worse for the material properties of the part and to causes it to weaken more, as well as potentially create some sort of a surface blemish that might show up in the part and ruin the aesthetics. So the question is, now that I've simulated this filling process and I have an idea of where the weld lines are going to be, does that change or impact the results that I saw earlier from my stress analysis? And of course, what I could do is just take a couple screenshots or look at uh, you know, two monitors or something like that to compare them side by side. And if I do that in this case, I can see that the static stresses on the left are, were mostly kind of in the corners there, but there was a little bit of stress around the mounting holes too. And so the weld lines, maybe more around the mounting holes there could potentially cause some issues. If, uh, if that stress ramped up even more, it might be susceptible to break the plastic in that weld line area. And there isn't a way, unfortunately, to see exactly how the weld lines have weakened the part because that's really complex and depends on a lot of variables such as uh, how rapidly the plastic came together and really what the polymer chains inside the material did. But as a general rule, you just want to make sure that these weld lines are not in the same high stress areas that you're seeing from a stress analysis. And so the good news is that right now they don't seem to be in the worst locations. Although I could try a design change or maybe changing something like the gate location to see if I could make this better. So of course, if I wanted to do that, the nice thing is that SolidWorks Plastics allows me to create a new study very easily and make that kind of a change to compare it. Uh, there's a button up here called Duplicate Study that I could click, which will just let me give it a new name and copy my study with all of the same setup. 
such as this one here that I've called gate B. And in this case, uh, I'm not going to change the design of the part, although I could, I could change any of these features on the model. Uh, but uh, what I am gonna do is try to change the injection location. You can see here now I've moved the gate to the back of the part to see if filling it from the opposite direction will make uh, for better weld lines. And of course, I could run this and go look at the results, which I have already done here. And I can see that the flow pattern is definitely different. It looks like it still fills in about the same amount of time and still requires about the same amount of pressure too. So those decisions aren't uh, gonna impact where I put the gate, but those weld lines might. And if I look at the weld lines plot, I can see that now they have in fact moved. And uh, I could go and compare these two, again, by taking a couple screenshots or looking at both models at the same time, for example and try to see which one's better. And in this case, I think it looks like if I examine where the sort of higher stress areas are from my SOLIDWORKS simulation study, then the second uh, gate location where it moves those weld lines is probably better. In particular, you can see down where the mounting holes were, the sides of those mounting holes look to be really low stress. That's basically just kind of extra material sort of hanging off the side of the cover. It's not really undergoing any kind of stress. And if the weld lines are in those locations, it's probably less likely to cause any kind of issue. So right here, by using SOLIDWORKS simulation and SOLIDWORKS plastics standard, I can pretty easily get a first pass check of whether or not these weld lines are really in the bad or problematic areas of the part. So that's probably the first thing that you would want to answer about both how the part will be manufactured and how it will be loaded. But there's another level that we can go to here for an even more realistic result. And that would be the question of what the real stresses in the part are. What do I mean by what are the real stresses in the part? Well, again, as we saw earlier, there of course is some stress in this part from when we put the loads on it and uh, try to stretch it. But those stresses are just the additional stress that happens when we actually you know, load the part. That doesn't necessarily mean that there weren't stresses in the part already. As you're probably aware, most types of material out there, and uh, you know, of course, have to be created through some sort of a manufacturing process. If you've got a piece of steel that may have been uh, forged, or uh, even before that, the steel may have been quenched to give it its properties in the first place. And any kind of manufacturing process can introduce what you'd call residual stresses into the part. There is going to be stress in the material before you even do anything to it. And so if you wanted to predict what those stresses are from the manufacturing process, we can also use SOLIDWORKS plastics to predict that. And of course, in many cases, depending on how complex a part is or how difficult it is to make, you might have very high stresses just from trying to mold the part, which make it susceptible to failure uh, right away. And in addition to that, what you can also do is use SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium to create a nonlinear study, which would then combine both the loading conditions that we apply to the part and the residual stresses from SOLIDWORKS plastics. So let's take a look at how that process would go. If I'm back here in SOLIDWORKS Plastics, you can see I've already made this decision to move the gate location to the back of the part. And right now, all I've calculated are these fill results, right? What does it look like when the cavity gets filled? But of course, there's a lot more to the injection molding process than that. Once you fill up a mold cavity, generally you have something called the pack phase where you continue to hold pressure on the mold to try to make sure that the part doesn't shrink too much. You're gonna hold pressure and try to get a little bit more material to get in there. And then of course, you also let that part sort of sit in the mold for some period of time, trying to get it to cool until it's safe to pop it out of the mold. And so that is called the pack phase. And if I go back to my plastics manager, you can see down here, there are some pack settings where I could put in that pressure holding time or that cooling time. And of course, in this case, I'm just gonna use the recommended defaults based on the part geometry and my material. So I'm not, I don't need to override those. But if I were to simulate the pack phase by going down here and double clicking pack under the run category, 
what I would get is now not only a fill animation, but I would get temperatures and pressures of this part as I'm going through the rest of the molding cycle. And in particular, you can look at something called an XY plot to see how, for example, the inlet pressure would change over time. You can see I'm filling the cavity here and then sort of holding pressure and dropping down gradually. And I can also look at how the mold flow rate looks over time. You can see, of course, I'm filling the cavity very rapidly at first. And then when I switch to the pack phase, the flow rate drops down to a very low value as a little bit of extra plastic is sort of seeping into the mold to prevent it from shrinking so much. And then I'm just letting the part sit there for a while. And of course, I can also look at temperatures over time. And, and this is really the key that uh, would cause residual stresses to develop. As we all know, any kind of material, when it uh, heats itself up or gets cooled down, will probably undergo thermal expansion, which can cause stress. So for example, the surface of the part there uh, cools down Oh, after about a minute and a half or so. And one of the plots that I could see if I run this pack analysis under my pack results are what we call the residual stress at post filling end. This is the amount of residual stress in the part when I'm ready to eject it from the mold. And you can see here just really quickly from some of those values, we're talking about residual stress of anywhere from 50 to 80 megapascals just from the process of the part cooling down to room temperature. Those are higher stresses than I saw in my first stress analysis from putting the force on the part. So it's very possible that my initial conclusions were not very good. And it depends, of course, on what material properties you are assuming in your stress analysis and also what yield strength in particular you're assuming. Sometimes the yield strength that someone will give you maybe has a bit of margin built into it, assuming that there's already some of this stress in the part, but other times there may not be. And it's probably safe to assume that there is not any kind of margin built in, and the part really will yield when it gets to that certain number. So what happens if I try to take these residual stresses that I see from the molding process and combine those with the load that I am simulating in SOLIDWORKS simulation? Well, I can go back to my plastics manager and there is a nifty export button that I can click here. And I can export these in mold residual stresses to SOLIDWORKS simulation or actually to a number of other programs as well, although those of course are not integrated into the SOLIDWORKS environment. If for whatever reason though, you wanted to use, let's say Simulia Abacus or some other multi-physics type of simulation, you could export to that as well. So I would, click the export button and save the results file that I need to the same folder as where the part is. And then if I go back to my SOLIDWORKS simulation add-in and click it here to turn that product on in the command manager, now I can create a nonlinear stress analysis, which will first of all more accurately simulate the deformed shape of the part and the stresses in the part, but it will also allow me to combine the loads that I'm defining with those residual stresses. So here I can go to a nonlinear simulation that I've created. And in fact, what I could do is duplicate the previous static study that I made into a nonlinear study using the copy study command, which would save me a little setup time. But you can see here, if I run this nonlinear stress analysis with the same exact conditions as I had before, it will take a little bit longer to solve this time because it's calculating the deformation and stress in steps so that it knows how the stiffness of the part might be changing or the material properties of the part might be changing as I load it up. But once I do that, of course, I'll be able to look at the same stresses and uh, factor of safety as before. <clears throat> and right now, since all I'm including is that 2,500 pounds of force, I should see fairly similar results. I can look at my stresses and displacements, of course. And if I remember previously in the static study, I got something like a factor safety of, I think, 2.6. If I do the same thing in the nonlinear study, it looks like it's actually slightly higher. The nonlinear study says 2.8. And again, this is going to be more accurate because of the, the changing stiffness of the part that it accounts for. But otherwise, still very similar result. The question is, 
how much is that going to change if I then add in those residual stresses from SolidWorks plastics? Well, the way that I would do this is simply right-click external loads, and there's an option right there called in mold residual stresses. So just like this ability of these stress analyses to import temperature or pressure loads from, let's say, SOLIDWORKS flow simulation or the thermal study, I can also import those in mold residual stresses from SOLIDWORKS plastics. And in fact, I can import not only the in mold stresses, if I go browse to that file, I can also import the material. And that's another huge benefit because, as you may be aware, the default SOLIDWORKS material library only has maybe 30 or so plastics in it. But now, because I've used SOLIDWORKS plastics, I have almost 5,000 materials I can choose from, and I can import those material properties directly. So if I were to add these in mold stresses in and go look at my results, here's the one that I ran earlier for this new gate. Now I've got the 2,500 pounds of force and the in mold stresses. And if I look at this result, I can see that first of all, the amount of deformation isn't drastically different. In fact, the, it's really not deforming that noticeably. So we're not talking about a huge amount of strain or displacement here, but I am talking about higher stress. And as it turns out, if I were to go switch to the factor of safety plot, now I'm seeing much higher factor, uh, excuse me, much lower factor of safety, in this case, around those mounting holes. And if I wanted to look at both of those results side by side, I have a neat tool called Compare Results. That's part of SOLIDWORKS simulation, which can help me do that. I could click Compare Results. I could go over here and select these two factor of safety plots from the different studies and try to figure out how much extra uh, stress or how much lower is the factor of safety because of that inclusion of the molding stresses. So it turns out my factor of safety is lower than I thought. And of course I could take some screenshots to compare those again, but this turns out to be a hugely important conclusion. The nonlinear study without the residual stresses from SOLIDWORKS plastics thinks that I have got a factor of safety of almost three. I could almost triple that force without having any problems. But as it turns out in reality, because this part is so large and because it takes so long to cool, there are significant residual stresses that occur from that 90 seconds or whatever it takes for your part to solidify and come out of the mold. And because of that, the residual stresses that develop in the part are even higher than those from the loading itself. And as it turns out, my factor of safety is barely over one. In fact, if I increase this load by any more than 2,500 pounds, it would probably yield the material and maybe even crack it. So if you're trying to make sure that a real world simulation of loading of a part is as realistic as possible, and you're trying to know for sure how much load something can take before it uh, it yields without any kind of additional margin. Simulating the molding process and confirming where those residual stresses might be coming from is absolutely key. And of course, at this point, once we've found this problem, it's probably not too late to make a change and take the stress out. Hopefully, we haven't even started building or designing the mold tooling yet. So we still have plenty of options available to us. We could improve the part design in some way by for example, thickening the material around the mounting hole to spread that stress out. Maybe I want more mounting locations, kind of more smaller holes, more evenly distributed so that there's less stress from those. Or I could try to change things about the molding process. Maybe I change the filling and packing times or temperatures, or I could try other gate locations besides the two that I looked at so far. Maybe I want two or three gates in the same cavity. Or, of course, I could try a stronger polymer. Maybe there's a bunch of other types of nylons out there that I want to compare and see if one of them has less residual stress from the molding process and also is able to withstand that 2,500 pounds better. The point of all this is that if you leverage two simulation products at the same time, SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium and SOLIDWORKS Plastics Professional, you can take the realism of the stress results you get to a much higher level than anything you might be doing uh, on their own. 
And of course, you can do that without ever having to leave the SOLIDWORKS design environment, which is the best solution for someone designing a new product, especially in the early stages of development. So hopefully everyone sees what an impact this kind of a process could have and uh, some different options for depending on how detailed you want to get. If you have any questions, feel free to put them into the questions pane uh, at the bottom of the GoToWebinar interface, and I will try to answer them here. Of course, as I mentioned earlier, feel free to follow up and uh, reach out to either the Hawkridge Systems tech support team um, or, of course, your local account manager, and we're happy to get you any other information you might have. The recording of this webinar will be posted on the Hawkridge Systems website, uh, which is, by the way, just been uh, revamped starting today brand new uh, layout if you want to go take a look at it. Um, but otherwise, I hope you guys are enjoying the webinar series for April. And if you have any other questions, please let me know. Otherwise, have a good rest of the week and a good weekend. Thanks. Mm -hmm.